Big Sky Podcast. guys, welcome back. Today's guest is Professor Barry Strauss. He's a professor of history at Cornell University and a best-selling author. My dad got me a book of his for my birthday a couple years ago. It was Ten Caesars from Augustus to Constantine, which I thoroughly enjoyed. Now, he has a new book out, which we didn't really talk about, but you should check out. It's called The War That Made the Roman Empire. This was a wonderful conversation. We got to talk about so many of the topics that I am very enthused about. We talked about everything from Alexander the Great to Hannibal Barca to the culture of historians and what the job of a historian actually is. So without further ado, enjoy my conversation with Barry Strauss. I am here with Barry Strauss. How are you doing today, Barry? I'm doing well, thank you. How about you, Zeke? I am great, and I'm very grateful to have you here on my podcast today. Um, I happened Pleasure. to catch your last podcast with Dan Carlin. Uh huh. Um, I had been very familiar with your work beforehand. I have to admit, I haven't read your new book yet, but I am very oh. intent on doing so. Good. You have a very distinct style of writing. I think that the description of uh, one reviewer was that you had Game of thrones <laughs> so much of history. But your history is, I mean, you, you write real histories. You Your style is just very, it's obviously didactic, but it is also very compelling and easy to right. write. So that is something right. that a lot of people will appreciate. But you have a long history as an academic historian. And my first question to you is how you like to think of your output and your work. Well, that's a good question. Um, I like to think of myself as a popularizer in the best sense of the term. Um, the Italians uh, call it divulgazione, um, and everything sounds better in Italian, let's face it. But uh, I think they think of it, they have a higher opinion of academics who write for a general audience than we do in the U.S. Popularizer tends to be um, almost a derogatory term in the American Academy. But I think, see myself as somebody who uses all the tools of an academic, of a scholar, tries to put them together in a way that tells a story and that speaks to a wider audience. Because I love those kind of history books. I always loved them growing up. Um, and I try to use them as a, as a model for what I do today and the people I want to reach. Well, what's wonderful about that is I think that you are right about America, and I think maybe in, in some senses the more developed world, maybe even, where we have this very reductionist picture about our science and our philosophy. Um, there's more and more that's emerging that is supposed to be very empirically sound, but I think when you look at the best histories, um, you know, I'm thinking of the Will Durants of the world. <laughs> There is this sense about prose and certitude that they right. seem to come together in a very, very desirable function. Um, I have also read there, I think it was Pierre Briant who said, um, even if it is not true, you must believe in ancient history. <laughs> There's some truth to that. There is some truth to that. But we, re we really try to, um, we really try to, um, to find the truth the best we can. Pierre Briant is an excellent practitioner of the of, of the art. So yeah, I mean, ancient history um, can be very frustrating and uh, it's more difficult to penetrate to what really happened than it is in modern history. Although I can tell you, having done some modern history, that's, that's not nearly as transparent as it may seem. It's not, truth is not nearly as, as clear as it may seem at first. 
Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And I think it's maybe even the nature <coughs> of living in sort of this modern panopticon where we see everything from acts, of, you know, the acts of violence that define our media right. cycle to right. everything else that there is this sense of certitude a lot of the time. Um, but yeah. the certitude is uh, maybe um, less translucent than we'd like to believe it is. I agree. Um, now, I, I wanted to ask you a few preliminary questions, then I wanted sure. to delve into some specific history topics. But sure. I had a historian on a couple weeks ago called Paul Ray, who wrote a right. fascinating book called The Spartan Regime. And I we talked about his book, but one of the things that I found very, very interesting about Paul was – when we talked about specific, I would call, say them as anecdo anecdotes, mm -hmm. um, there was a sense in which he found certain historians and certain stories more credible and more believable, and other historians and stories, you know, less believable. And I think that, you know, when you're reading Herodotus, for example, sure. there are elements of Herodotus that are so clearly, you don't want to call them fabrications, but you, there are certain things you just can't believe. There are certain mm -hmm. things that are just beyond the pale. So I'm not even really talking about that. I'm talking about these stories where something happens that seems to amplify the cultural nature or something that's already really well understood in a culture. And it, it almost seemed like he treated ancient historians as coming on a scale of the most believable to least believable. Um, do you have a method like that? Is this a real thing? Am I making this up in my head? Um, no. I mean, first of all, I, I know Paul, and I, I esteem him. I esteem his work, so I take it very seriously. Uh, yeah, I mean, some ancient historians are more credible than others. Uh, to defend Herodotus, I will point out that he often says, that's what they say. He's, he's someone who's reporting what people say often. Uh, and we might say, well, he should have been more skeptical about it, but, but often he's just telling us what they say, and we have to judge for ourselves. Um, some ancient historians take, some of the, the historians who wrote in antiquity take great pains to try to get the facts right. Um, others don't. Uh, quite often, generally, they have an axe to grind. Uh, they have a political position they're taking. <clears throat> and um, we always have to Take, take account of that, take into account. If you look at someone like Josephus, for instance, who's both a historian and a player, um, in the Jewish war famously, he starts out opposing the rebellion, then becoming such a part of the rebellion that he's one of the commanding generals, and then he goes over to the Romans and spends the rest of his life in Rome, uh, but writing books that defend the Jews. So that's pretty complicated if you think of all the different agendas he has in different places he's coming from. And we have to take that into account uh, when, we, when we read him. Uh, often with ancient historians, Josephus, Herodotus, Thucydides, for example, it's been a lot of archaeology that allows us to have some control on what, whether what they're saying is true or not, the degree to which it's true. Um, and material culture is really very helpful in general. We have inscriptions and we have coins, uh, and that also allows us to to get some sense of of what's true and what's not true. I see, and I I'm, I sense that that is true a great deal of the time. And I just wonder about being in the position of being an an ancient historian. One of the pr people who comes to mind um, that I think is. No, I don't want to say unbiased, but I read him and I, I feel the sober-mindedness is Polybius. Um, I feel a very—he um, says it an, a lot in his preface, but I can tell that he really, really disdains um, sort of the supernatural diatribes that come along with a lot of things in the, the ancient world. And when you, when you put it that way and when you say that Herodotus sort of reported what he was told, it sort of elucidates this point, which is— that to be an ancient historian, you probably had to travel around a lot to see things for yourself, mm -hmm. because there were certainly a lot of rumors about places and people that certainly were not true. Yeah. Um, I wonder if you could maybe tell a little bit about, you know, some of the wonders of the ancient world as they are told. And the, the my I, general idea here is, what kind of fantastical elements enter into ancient history that seem to 
maybe transcend lots of authors? Uh, well, many of them believe in the gods, uh, or in Josephus's case, in God. So that's that is an element. It's a strong element in Herodotus. Uh, in Thucydides, it's debated as to what extent it is an element, but I think uh, on some level it is there. Uh, it's certainly there in Livy. Uh, so, yeah, a belief in divinity is part of ancient history. I think very few people in the ancient world were out and out atheists and would have said there are no gods whatsoever. There are some who say that, but in general, ancient historians don't don't take that position. So there's going to be a, a, a sense of the divine. I mean, Herodotus is, is a really good case because it's clear that he's got this whole, he's part of the whole, what we call the archaic Greek cultural complex of, um, you know, hubris and ate and nemesis, uh, of people being arrogant and uh, of them being put in their place by, by the gods. Thucydides believes in a cycle of history. I think that's a strong part of Thucydides. It's in Polybius as well. It's certainly a major part of Plato. So whether we'd call that fantastical or super, ration, super rational, I'm not sure, but, but it is part of, uh, of these historians. Livy believes in the destiny of Rome, and he is telling us a story what we call Livy's histories, he called Ab Orbe Condita, from the founding of the city. Uh, and he takes the story of the founding of the city, the rise of Rome, its decline through corruption of morals, and the attempt to purify and restore Roman morals in the days of Augustus. So perhaps we'd call that a fantastical element as well. And then in Herodotus, there are things like flying snakes. That's pretty much fantastical by anyone's standards. Yeah, I mean, it, it seems like a lot of these things become tropes in future, you know, uh, things like Lord of the Rings, and I, I think that's a lot of the the reason that the modern mind comes into contact with them. I was reading Arian the other day, mm -hmm. and I think he was describing a shrine to Amon. It, mm -hmm. it was part of Alexander the Great, right? And it's right. this it's this kind of oasis he's talking yes. about, yes. where the water is very cold in the middle of the desert. Uh -huh. And it's just this uh, balming type place. I what I really really like about these elements is even w whether or not the art, you know, the the person who wrote about them thought they were true, that they emerged as rumors, as places that were very real, is is very interesting to me. And I do wonder very frequently about how pious these people were in believing in certain mythologies here on Earth. Um, and uh, one of the things I'm curious about. Mm -hmm. is, uh, you know, let's take the Spartans, for example, who are uh -huh. thought to be very pious, correct right. me if I'm wrong, but thought right. to be very yeah, pious. Right, yeah, sure. Um, you know, there's all this stuff that goes on where they're very oriented towards their sacrifices and mm -hmm. towards the seasonal machinations of the world, you know, the earth. Right. Um, you know, the E-Force right. obviously will or will right. not let them go to right. war in certain circumstances. Do you think these Spartan kings who hopefully were smarter than the average person living in Sparta, really believed in these portents, or is this a cynical way of manipulating a population? I think that in general they did believe in the, they did believe in the portents. I think we have to be careful. We're living, you know, in the West in the early 21st century, and we tend to have a very secular outlook. Uh, we also have science and technology in particular to point to, and we can say, see, we know the gods don't exist because we can do all this thing through science and technology. But in the ancient world, they didn't have that, uh, that crutch of science and technology by and large. I think most people did believe the gods existed and they, they, they took it seriously. Certainly in Sparta they did. We have examples, we have some examples from antiquity of people not believing in religion, but they usually get their comeuppance. For instance, I don't remember whether it's in Polybius or Livy or in another author. I think it's in Polybius. There's a, a, an admiral, a Roman admiral in the First Punic War. And, you know, the Romans were very superstitious. And before going to a battle, they would take the, uh, the auspices. In this case, um, the sacred chickens had to eat in order for it to be uh, religiously safe to go into battle. The chickens wouldn't eat. 
So this Roman admiral said, well, if the chickens won't eat, let them drink. And he throws the chickens overboard into the sea. Chickens drown. And he goes on to lose the battle. So on the one hand, here we have this guy who's a skeptic. On the other hand, we're told a story to prove that the gods really do exist because he's punished. So I think that tells us something about the outlook of, of the ancient world. Well, I, I like that explanation of things because I always go back and forth in my brain and I'm always looking for examples that confirm or deny one or the other. Um, let's, uh, let's talk about some specific figures here. Sure. Um, I have a couple of things that I'm interested in that I, I wanted your thoughts on. Um, Alexander the Great. This yeah. is a topic that I, I think probably got more attention in the ancient world, but I think the story is incredible. Mm -hmm. And I want to kind of understand some things. For one, there's this idea out there that the only contemporary source about Alexander is a one-sentence monolith. Hmm. And that the whole thing has maybe been purged and the record's cold because Alexander needed to be portrayed in Homeric terms. What do you make of this? Well, um, we have more than a one-sentence monolith about Alexander. We have a few inscriptions about Alexander. We have a few coins about Alexander, and we have some references and contemporary speeches about Alexander. Still, it must be admitted when all is said and done, it's pretty shocking how few contemporary references we have and the extent to which we're dependent on histories written during the Roman era that um, are, in many cases, are based on histories that were written at the time or shortly afterwards. And there's been very good scholarship that points out that to some extent, the image of Alexander we have is a Roman Alexander. We see Alexander to a certain extent through Roman eyes, which is pretty weird when you think about it. Um, true, it's, it's often through the eyes of Greek-speaking Romans like Arian, but it, it's, it, it's problematic. You know, it's very hard to penetrate to the truth of Alexander. We do have a fair amount of contemporary or contemporary-ish evidence about his father, Philip. We do know some things about the period, and we do have archaeology, which is helpful. The material culture is helpful as well. But yeah, there's no doubt about it. It's to a very uncomfortable degree. We're dependent on later sources. I can't help but notice that in the preface to Arian, or, the, when, or not even in the, the preface, actually, it actually happens somewhere maybe in the first couple of pages where he's talking about the incursion into Persia, he says something to the effect of, this is the most important thing I'm ever going to do with my life. It's that, clear to me, it, he says something like, uh, you know, uh, this is one of the most consequential things I could ever commit my time and energy to. Um, it's clear to me that whatever was going on with him made him feel very compelled to tell this story. Now, right. the way you put put this is that there's a romanized version of alexander that's right. kind of emerging um can you drill into that a little bit more because sure. like i i see part of that one of the problems that i'm having with that though is that there there are very distinct elements that makes out Al that make alexander very very different from any of these roman figures I, I would point out for one um that the macedonians were sort of a backwater type place mm-hmm and he's he's a little bit difficult, I think, for you know a, an aristocratic Roman to admire for anything other than his military abilities. Right. So uh, it's true that Macedon uh, was a backwater, but Alexander was part of the court culture of Macedon, which was um, mostly fairly cultivated and fairly sophisticated. After all, Alexander's tutor was no less a figure than Aristotle one of the greatest philosophers in history. So while Alexander could play the populace to be um, anachronistic uh, and speak to ordinary Macedonians, he was not really one of them. He really came from a different culture. So I don't think it'd be that difficult for a, a Roman era figure like Arian to, to admire Alexander. Uh, the other thing we can't forget is that Arian was a Greek he came from the Greek-speaking part of the Roman Empire. And so for him, Alexander is very important because he gives the Greeks bragging rights. And even in the height of the Roman Empire, sophisticated Romans felt inferior to Greece and to the Greeks because of 
the supremacy of Greek culture, and there's no doubt about it. Greek culture really was supreme in the Mediterranean world, um, superior to Latin uh, culture, high culture in many ways. And so by championing, championing Alexander, uh, Arian is also championing the Greek half of the empire. But he's, there's another agenda as well, uh, and that is that um, he is playing up to the Roman Emperor Hadrian, who is the most Philhellenic of the Roman emperors. Um, and so uh, he knows that Hadrian's going to like this. And finally, the Romans have this long-standing uh, war or series of wars against the Parthians, the heirs of the Persian Empire. So by telling a story in which the, um, the, the Macedonians read the Romans, defeat the, the Persians or the Parthians, uh, Arian is also telling a story that would be very appealing to Roman the Roman audience. So uh, it's almost overdetermined how important this is to him. Okay, great. I I loved all of that. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Um, so uh, I'm just going to ask one final question about Alexander here. Sure. Um, so be that as, as it may, Arian's story of Alexander does right. take time to identify some of the specific acts that Alexander takes some of the specific things he does in Persia that I think Arian thinks outlines the objective, like when he's burning specific temples right. and when he's issuing vengeance on specific places that it right. would be more cynically obvious for him to just take this submission of. To Arian, this is the, basically Alexander the Great is the hammer of God coming back for everything Xerxes did, mm -hmm. you know, hundreds of years ago. Is mm -hmm. this true? Is it true about Arian or true about Alexander? Is it true that Alexander had some sort of, um, that this is a conquest of revenge and evening hmm. the tables, or evening the scores? Uh, it's hard to know. Alexander certainly said it was. He said that was his motive. It's a little hard to know how seriously we should take that. First, because the Macedonians at the time of Xerxes' invasion they supported Xerxes. They're on the side of Xerxes. So uh, is this Alexander being utterly cynical, or is it Alexander who wants to show that he is now really part of Greek culture? But Alexander's a funny guy. I think Alexander's a very religious guy in a way, and it may be that he does take this seriously. By the same token, Alexander changes a lot over the course of his, over the course of his campaign. And... He may have started out as somebody who is entirely pro-Greek and anti-Persian, but he clearly, as he goes further eastward, he's somebody who warms up to the Persians in a big way, uh, and that becomes an, an, an important part of what he's doing. So, yeah, he's the guy who burns down Persepolis. Maybe that's revenge for the burning of the temples on the Acropolis. It also serves a very valuable political purpose. It makes clear to the Persians that their gods are not going to save them and that it takes away a symbol of resistance to the Macedonian conquest. Um, it also, uh, frankly, it's an act of terror and it says to the population, don't mess with us. The Macedonians have to worry about that because there's never very many of them. They're conquering an empire with a pretty small army. Uh, and they have to do whatever they can to, as a force multiplier to give people motives, to give people disincentives to rise up against them. Okay, yeah. And I, I, I think that Darius probably gave them some disincentives himself. I think it's amazing that he was even able to raise an army for that battle at Gaugamela after running mm -hmm. away from Alexander at Isis. Um, it's clear to me that... Um, you know, based on at least Arian's account of things, that this is this was a very unlucky moment for uh, Persia in in terms of the king that they were able to bring to the fore there. Uh -huh. Um, and uh, which brings me to my next major major fascination, which is Hannibal Barca. Right. Um, I am curious uh, what you think about the motivations of that conquest. Um, Hannibal Barca seems to me to be a, you know, it seems to me like the Romans figured out that this 30 year old general who had this 30 year old kid really, um, was some kind of genius and that he needed to be taken really seriously after, you know, maybe the first big battle that he wages mm -hmm. there. 
I am just wondering, um, is this a question of restoring the status quo antebellum? Is, is that the question for Hannibal? Or is this part of him maybe vicariously realizing his father's dreams? What do you think are the motivational terms for Hannibal Barca? Well, they're not, uh, they don't contradict each other. His father's dream was to restore Carthage's power before losing the First Punic War. Um, and so Hannibal wants to do both. He wants to restore the part Carthaginian Empire. He wants to ensure that Carthage is safe from from Roman uh, Roman imperialism and Roman brutality. Uh, and that will that will avenge his father, but will also um, make his country safe. And it will give him the reputation as being a military genius. So he wants he wants all that. And does that ultimately, for, for people who don't know the specifics of the story, Hannibal Barca is a young general who comes over from a place called Carthage. He is the guy who crosses the Alps with a bunch of elephants. He is an extremely important figure of military history and antiquity. But right. there is a moment where um, he is near Rome, and he does not march on Rome. Right. Um, <clears throat> Why is that part of this? He doesn't feel the need to go into Rome. It's a great question, and later on, Hannibal says he regrets that he didn't march on Rome. But at the time, uh, you know, the time when he's thinking of marching on Rome is after his great victory at the Battle of Cannae in August of 2016. And he says he doesn't march on Rome because his army is exhausted. Uh, and also because it would have been very difficult to take Rome. He probably didn't have what was needed to successfully carry out a siege of Rome at that point because it was a very well-defended city. Uh, the question is, could he have terrorized people there into opening the gates? Could he have found, um, could he have found um, traitors who would have opened the gates to him because he would have negotiated with them and offered him a deal? Um, could he also have terrorize some of Rome's close allies into going over to his side at that time? Um, these, are, these are questions. Yeah, and it's fair to say that a decade or more uh, is spent by Hannibal basically terrorizing the Romans and using some truly novel military tactics right. to, dis, to truly, truly, I mean, eat away at some of these Roman armies. The Battle of Cannae is mm -hmm. obviously the famous example. Right. Um, I'm curious, what what happens uh, between Scipio or Scipio and in Rome that they are eventually able to defeat Hannibal at Zama? What happens is they decide if they can't beat him, they should join him. Uh, they, the Romans, uh, led by Scipio, uh, emulate Hannibal's tactics. They change the way they fought. They've been fighting a very unsophisticated uh, version of, of battlefield tactics. And they, they train new armies that can fight with the kind degree of maneuverability that Hannibal uh, can fight. Uh, they entrust their future to a, a young man, Scipio, who they wouldn't have wanted, which they wouldn't have wanted to do earlier. Uh, and Scipio also turns out to be an extremely cunning and shrewd diplomat. And that's one of Hannibal's calling cards, cunning. Um, Scipio is, can match him for that and can use tricks on the battlefield to the same degree that Hannibal can and, and, and can win over allies as, as Hannibal had done. So the Romans create a sort of Roman Hannibal and Scipio, and that's, that, that goes a long way to, towards explaining their victory. Great. Okay. So I, I, I see a lot of that in the writing. One of the things I can't help but notice, though, you use the word cunning. Hannibal doesn't strike me that way as a politician. Um, Hannibal strikes me as um, sort of unable to communicate with G the Gerosia when he comes back from this long battle, um, which brings me to an interesting question. So I am just curious, um, before I get to my final topic here, um, yeah. what is it that um, maybe makes some people extraordinary generals and um, precludes them from being good politicians? Well, I mean, most people are good at only one thing. First of all, I, I would disagree with you somewhat. I think that Hannibal was a good politician. Um, inevitably, he had trouble with the Gerousia, the Council of Elders, when he came back to Carthage. Uh, 
because they distrusted him. Here was this guy who'd hardly been in Carthage in his life. He'd only left Carthage when he was at the age of eight. Now he's coming back after many decades away. And he was all but a king out in the field. So they're concerned that he is going to usurp their power. But most people are good at one thing. Most of us are not good at more than one thing. So I'd say the rule is that someone will be a good general and not such a good politician. Um, and vice versa. Of course, being a good general often requires a certain degree of political skill. So it's not totally unheard of for people to be good generals and to be good politicians, but it's not easy. Okay, so I'm actually, I can put this into one question and you can just go ahead. I sure. want you to take, take some time to respond to it. And then I want to plug your podcast. We could actually do that right now. Um, can you tell people real quick before I ask this last question about your podcast? Sure. My podcast is called Antiquitas, Leaders and Legends of the Ancient World. Uh, it's been on for several seasons now, and I, I try to take people pretty much through what it says. I try to take people through, through the great leaders of antiquity, um, military leaders mostly, but some political leaders as well, men mostly, but also some women, both legendary like Helen and real like... Uh, real historical characters like Livia. And I try to give people a sense of what it is that made these people great, what lessons we can learn from them, what are their things about them that are, that are less than admirable. Always keeping in mind that good history should tell a story as well as being you know, rooted in fact and rooted in, rooted in scholarship. Excellent. And the music is very good too, I will point out. Oh, thank um, you. Uh, I, I take no credit for that. Oh, okay. All right. Um, okay. So here is my final question. I'm going to kind of encapsulate stuff here. But, yeah. Um, one of the things that I am very, very fascinated by uh -huh. is this, this question of how you get people to fight for a cause and how you get people to do the things we were talking of. We've talked about this whole time. Right. And, you know, martial armies. I forget who said it. It was a Roman. I don't want to say it was Caesar. I think it was someone before him who said, uh, you know, you've been on this war this whole time, but there's not a single uh, foot of ground that you can call your own. Hmm. Um, there are all these problems that develop in Rome where these um, warring popular or these soldiers don't seem to be compensated fairly enough. They don't right. really have the greatest standard of life, and they're doing this thing that's horrific. Mm -hmm. And then Julius Caesar comes around, and it seems like he's paying his soldiers more than the going rate is, is one thing I notice. <laughs> um, can you maybe just tell people what you think it is that builds great soldiery? Okay. So uh, I think your quotation is from Tiberius Gracchus, and he's talking about a period in Roman history where the soldiers were being very ill-treated uh, by the uh, by the by the Roman elite who was taking away their their land. Uh, certainly, one of the things that's required is telling, giving soldiers some sense that they're going to get some reward for what they did, for their sacrifice, that it will pay off when they come home for themselves and their families, and also that they'll let them know that their families will be well taken care of should they die in battle. That's one of the things Alexander did. He's very careful to send money back to Macedon and let everyone know he would take care of the uh, Macedonians. Um, Caesar and some of his predecessors, what became what they what happened with them was that they created a real bond between the men that they led and their leaders. It was partly because the leaders were charismatic and because they always paid attention to the men and their needs and make sure they were well fed, but also because there was a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Exactly as you said, Caesar paid his troops incredibly well. Uh, he was able to do so in part because he conquered Gaul, which is this enormously wealthy place, and he loots the daylight out of it. Um, after Caesar's assassination, when there's competition between Mark Antony and Octavian over who is going to get the loyalty of Rome, Rome's troops, Octavian wins easily because he offers the men a lot more money. And as for the assassins of Caesar, Brutus and Cassius, they didn't even know how to play the game. Uh, they say to Caesar's troops after the assassination, don't worry, we're not going to take anything away from you. Where Caesar's troops were thinking, you know, the, the starting gate is that you're going to give us a raise. The question is how big a raise you're going to give us. And Brutus and Cassius, they don't even know they're supposed to give these guys a raise. So they're hopeless. 
they learn later on, but in the beginning, they don't understand. Okay. Well, thank you so much, uh, Professor Strauss. You're welcome. Um, do you have anything you'd like to tell anyone uh, about your book? Anything like that? Uh, if you are interested in these stories, if you like the stories of the ancient world, um, then I think you'll like uh, The War That Made the Roman Empire, Antony, Cleopatra, and Octavian at Actium, because it's one of the most exciting stories of them all, and it's got Cleopatra. What more could you ask for? Excellent. Well, thank you so much, and uh, yeah, I hope to be speaking to you again sometime soon, and uh, thank you. We're signing off here. You're welcome. Great.